This session is a continuation of the interview for the Veterans History Project with Ralph Wagner Woolard, and I'm going to spell Woolard, W-O-O-L-A-R-D, a highly decorated veteran of the European Theater of World War II who was with the U.S. Army's 36th Infantry Division serving from April 1943 to October 6, 1945. The first interview took place on July 19th, the second on July 30th. Today is August 7, 2007, and we are in the WILL television studio in Campbell Hall at the University of Illinois in Urbana, Illinois. Uh, my name is Harriet Williamson. I'm a producer with WILL Radio. Also in the studio is Mr. Woolard's wife, Wilma Lee Broughton Woolard, and Julius Bolton, who is director of lighting, sound, and camera. Uh, Mr. Woolard, in the last session, you had described your recovery from wounds at a battle north of uh, Rome in the spring of 1944, uh, rejoining your squad as they entered the south of France and proceeded into the French wine country. Uh, the Battle of Celestat, followed by uh, another battle, ribot Valais, where you were again wounded on December 17, 1944. And when the tape ended in the last session, you were approaching the Siegfried Line, and you were describing the German fortifications of that line. And I, I was wondering, uh, is there anything that you uh, recall f that you would like to add from our last session? Well, thank you. Yes. Uh, there's one incident that I would like to address. Uh, as you know, part of our work is locating enemy artillery units. And uh, we were in an area known as the Ardennes, which is a heavily forested area in south uh, southeast Belgium and uh, where it touches Germany. And <clears throat> we were uh, held up there. And part of the holdup was the Germans had a lot of artillery at that particular place. And uh, the intelligence officer uh, directed uh, our squad to go to uh, a house that was uh, located all to itself. There were no other houses around. Uh, it was a house with an attached barn where they kept cattle in the barn, just a wall between the barn and the house, typical of that area. And uh, it was this place stood out like a sore thumb in a in a clearing. And uh, we knew pretty well that uh, if we were to go there, we would get artillery fire. Um, and if it was not directed at us, it would be directed to some of the other units some distance away from us. So <clears throat> uh, in the cover of darkness before dawn, um, my squad went to this house, and uh, we were afforded three riflemen from an infantry company as extra protection. And uh, we uh, quickly got into the house. Uh, we decided how we were going to carry out the observation. It was a two-story house. Three of us uh, went upstairs to look out windows, and uh, the remainder of the men on the lower floor. We would periodically change positions because, as you, uh, in uh, observing, you get tired after a while. You lose your concentration. So we, I was upstairs with two men, and uh, we were pretty certain that at daylight the Germans would know we were there. And uh, that was, um, we were to, if at all possible, take what we call an azimuth on the direction of the German fire. Now this is usually done at night, but uh, you can do a bit of it during the 
daylight hours. So <clears throat> without going into too much detail on that, uh, shortly after daybreak, we knew that we had been discovered there. And uh, we had, uh, we heard incoming shell. And uh, the three of us who were upstairs rolled ourselves into a tight ball and try to protect yourself. Fortunately, it hit the roof, and uh, that is the first round did. And uh, succeeding rounds uh, mostly hit the roof. And uh, also hit a small tree, which was outside the, uh, the house, of course. Now, prior to uh, this artillery coming in, uh, one, one of the uh, three fellows who had been afforded to us by a rifle company uh, was a BAR man who was Browning Automatic Rifle. And uh, in trying to position ourselves, if we were ever attacked uh, by infantry, well, <clears throat> he suggested that he occupy a small shed, which was some 30 or 40 feet from the house. And uh, from that shed, he had a good, what we call field of fire, he, about 180 degree uh, movement of his uh, weapon. And he could, he could cover about 180 degrees of a circle. And uh, <clears throat> so he was there. Um, we kept getting this artillery fire we observed it as best we could, uh, but uh, soon drove us downstairs to the first first floor. And suddenly the artillery stopped and uh, we saw movement. Uh, now the house was located in a clearing. Beyond the clearing were trees, heavily forested area. And uh, we saw a movement in, in among those trees. We knew that, that we would be uh, attacked by infantry. Uh, I must say that at this time in the war, the Germans had lost a lot of their good officers and their good uh, non-commissioned officers. And it was a, not a prudent move on the part of the uh, officer or non-commissioned officer who was in charge of the Germans. If he was going to attack us, uh, it would have been far better for him to wait till nightfall and then come across, try to get behind us. Um, so uh, these German soldiers, uh, they were directed to get across uh, the clearing, and this clearing also had a, a trail or a little road running in into it and out of it. And uh, the first Germans that we saw tried to cross one of those trails or roads. And uh, fortunately, we had enough firepower to be, prevent any of them from getting across. And certainly the BAR man, who was adding his bit to the whole thing. And uh, then, uh, I, again, they tried. And again, this BAR man took, took charge of things. And uh, he uh, prevented any Germans from crossing that road. Uh, but there were several of them over there, and one of the things that I did was to call for mortar fire uh, from some of the mortar people who were some distance away from us, but they had uh, not not an uh, air map, but a uh, typical map showing topographical features, and uh, they knew where we were. And uh, they uh, 
uh, and a few minutes after I called for fire, my first round landed. It was too far, uh, it was too distant to do any good. Uh, I told them that they'd have to bring it in 50 or 60 feet or so, which they did, and we knew by the uh, sound of wounded Germans that uh, the mortars were doing their work. And that pretty well took the starch out of the German attack. Mm -hmm. uh, we were delighted, of course, and all of us uh, knew that this BAR man had done his bit. So in a few moments, uh, I called over to him, and uh, another, no one answered. So <clears throat> I decided to go over, went over, and found that uh, he had a hold of his weapon and his finger still in the trigger guard of the weapon. And, but he was dead. And uh, I remember that, uh, that it was, I, I just couldn't quite comprehend the thing. He was a young man, probably three, three or four years older than than my years, but uh, uh, he had afforded us protection that uh, uh, was just uh, outstanding. He, uh, I picked him up. His body was still warm. Carried him over to the uh, barn section and uh, called the other men in, and I guess we just all stood around the fellow. And one of those moments when the most profound thing you can do is to just remain quiet. So <clears throat> I never knew his name, uh, but I told the, the uh, two fellows from his rifle company that when they got back to their company, they had to tell a story of this fellow. I, I would probably never get in touch with their company again, uh, but uh, they should uh, let their commanding officer know what he did and put him in for a decoration. Now, in a few moments, uh, I got a, there was a, a telephone line had been, uh, a, a, laid to this house uh, at the time we went into the house in the morning. So uh, I received a telephone call that uh, we were to go back to our own company where the company was going to move out to some other position. And uh, so I never got uh, uh, beyond that. I had to leave the two riflemen there with him. We asked for a stretcher to be brought over. and. Uh, to get him out, but it was one of those instances when a fellow, evidently a small, uh, what had happened, a shell had hit a tree over the shed, and there had been a small piece of shrapnel enter his back. He was on his belly, his stomach, uh, firing the weapon, and this piece entered his back and it must have just hit a, a nick to an artery, and he just slowly bled to death. But during the time he was uh, alive, he continued to shoot the weapon. So it was <clears throat> one of those things that you never forget, seeing that you don't want to forget, really. Well, <clears throat> that was uh, in mid-November, and uh, there was a lot of war left. We, uh, uh, I'll skip forward now to the Siegfried Line, which takes us up into March. About March 19th, about March 20th, uh, the Siegfried Line was a series of fortifications that uh, destined to just keep anyone from getting into Germany. And uh, 
huge pieces of concrete, uh, row after row, so that the tanks absolutely couldn't get over. Uh, uh, they were, consisted of a series of pill boxes. These pill boxes were concrete fortifications built into the side of hills, and uh, they uh, had concrete uh, walls about three feet thick with little gun apertures in which they could stick a machine gun and shoot out. Uh, <clears throat> The only way to get to those was we had a group of engineers with us who were uh, acquainted with explosives. And uh, they used a, what was called a beehive. The beehive is shaped like a funnel and it's cl closed on the large end. And the only opening into it is a very small piece that sticks out. And you have to get up to the pillbox some way and fasten that on the pillbox so that the small end of the funnel is directed into the concrete. And uh, in order to do that, you have some sticky stuff that, uh, that you can put on the legs of this thing. You push it against the pillbox and it holes in place, and then you, uh, the uh, engineers get back. Before getting back, they uh, start a fuse burning and, and the thing then eventually explodes. But it will knock a hole through three, three feet of concrete and kill anybody inside. Mm. The concussion will kill anyone. So that was... Uh, uh, accomplished in our area by a group of engineers who worked with the infantry. Uh, the way they got up to the concrete pillbox was if the infantry would keep a steady rain of fire into the aperture and then allow the engineers to crawl up, which they did. And eventually uh, we uh, got through that I recall a, a, a very chilling scene uh, on the 19th, just the day we penetrated, or the day before we penetrated the line and blew it up. Uh, we had taken a prisoner. I've forgotten the circumstances of how we took this prisoner, but he had been horribly wounded. and. Uh, we had no way of getting him back at the time to a aid station. And uh, he begged all night to be shot. Uh, you, you can't forget those things, so they just continue to ring in, in your ears at times. Uh, but he wanted, his face was so dis, would be so disfigured, and he was blinded. Uh, no shut off. Uh, it was terrible shape, but he asked to be killed. No one would do it. Uh, it's, uh, I can think of only one other instance like that on the casino line, when a German in a, uh, that was wounded was in a foxhole that was half full of water, and uh, he kept asking to be. He was terribly wounded, asking to be killed. And I think finally some GI must have come along and just mercifully put his head under the water and drowned him mm -hmm. because it was going on all night. Well, <clears throat> uh, we got through the uh, Siegfried uh, line by the March 20th and uh, by March 23rd, I recall that uh, there was a tank battalion that got to the Rhine River, and uh, it was a kind of a high water mark. But from then on, we were fighting in small villages, 
the Germans were putting up a lot of resistance, but they just didn't have the capacity anymore to uh, to really slow us down for very long. And then, after crossing the Rhine, and uh, we ran into a slave labor camp. Uh, this was not a concentration camp in a conventional sense, uh, but a slave labor. These were Russians and Estonians and Latvians and uh, Jewish people who were uh, put to work in a nearby factory. And they were given very meager rations, not enough to keep you alive. You worked until you died. And then they brought in other slave laborers to fill the place. But the Germans were retreating at this point. They wanted to hide this slave labor camp, but it was impossible because we got there before they could do the job. And uh, there were about 100 bodies in a big pit that had been recently dug. And then the Germans had poured diesel fuel or gasoline over these uh, bodies and set them afire. There were uh, still slave laborers in the camp. They were just uh, in rags and tatters. They were uh, malnourished. They were skin and bones. So there were certain things that uh, some people these days don't seem to want to believe. But uh, believe me, there were terrible conditions. Terrible. Uh, <clears throat> we did have one large city we took called Kaiserslautern. It's probably a city of 60, 70,000 people. And it was defended uh, pretty well. But uh, after pushing the Germans out, there were a few civilians around. And we began, uh, the U.S. Army began moving through this town with tanks and trucks and all kinds of equipment. And this German fellow alongside the road said, why did it take you so long? He, he could not fathom the amount of equipment that we had. You know, mm. They were just overpowering. Well, what they didn't realize was that it took us a long time because we had to cross 3,000 miles of water to get all that equipment there. And the American factories uh, by this time were turning out tanks like they were Ford automobiles, you know, they're just clicking them out. So there was a reason that it took, good reason it took so, so long. Uh, on March, in March, we knew pretty well that the war was over. Uh, by the first day of March. Uh, we were down in southern Germany. We were continuing to advance. Uh, we crossed the border into Austria. And uh, <clears throat> on March 5th, I believe it was, we received orders not to advance anymore. Now, we knew pretty well that uh, some of the highest uh, ranking people politically and and also militarily were had retreated into Austria deep in the mountains and uh, we <clears throat> the army sent out some special units to look for them and we began to get messages from them that they wanted to give up so the arrangements that were made for some of these people to come in and give themselves up. And uh, among them, Hermann Goring, who was the second man to Adolf Hitler and head of the 
German Air Force. Uh, I'll come into him a little bit later, but on March March 8th, then, I believe it was, the war was over. We were told that uh, and the Germans were signaled that they were ready to give up. We were asked to establish uh, uh, points along the highways in Austria and just wait for the German soldiers to walk our way and give themselves up, which they began doing. As they came in, we, uh, uh, they, ca they, were, they came in with their weapons and uh, we told them where to put their guns. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And uh, so uh, we told them where to put their guns. Uh, if they had liquor, and some of them did, uh, where to put that. Uh, we, uh, some of the German officers uh, felt that uh, they would have a right to keep their own weapon, their pistol particularly. Uh, that was, and we were, they were, they were told quickly that that would not be. Some of them, some of the officers were rather haughty and uh, still wanted to uh, let you know that uh, they were a superior group. Uh, some of them even came in as platoons and the officer would come in, he'd have them all lined up in a platoon formation. He would stand in front and, uh, sub and uh, surrender his group. Well, that went on for a few days. And uh, after a while, the number of soldiers, uh, German soldiers giving up uh, uh, just decreased and things got very quiet. Uh, in respect to Hermann Goring and some of the others, the 143rd Infantry of our division, was uh, elements of it were assigned to meet Hermann Goring at a certain place in Austria. We, that had all been worked out. And uh, he came in with a whole retinue of, uh, uh, well, a whole series of trucks. And these trucks were loaded with art, uh, paintings. Uh, 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 Goring always wore gloves. And uh, he had one little pickup truck full of nice gloves. Well, he thought he would be able to keep all this. Uh, he was, after all, second in command to Hitler. And he, vis he envisioned that he would have a house someplace and uh, things would be all right. But they, they were not. He was stripped of all those things immediately. Whatever happened to them, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, he was then ultimately brought to trial and he committed suicide. Uh, with our squad, it got quiet in Austria and uh, I found a uh, little chalet there near our company headquarters and that's where we put up. It's a nice place. I don't know who owned it, or, but uh, we were there. And then all of a sudden I got, I got a uh, call that there was a disturbance in a farmhouse uh, in the valley and uh, somebody had been killed. So uh, I took some squad members and we went down and uh, it had been, a, I think, a Russian who had been forced to work on this Austrian farm and uh, he had been treated as a slave, you know, beaten, and uh, uh, I don't know what all had happened to him. But he 
was seeking revenge. And uh, he had taken an axe and killed this farmer. It's a big broad axe. And he made mincemeat of this farmer. It was a terrible scene. And our job was to take him into custody, and uh, which we did. Took him up to the house where we were staying, reported into battalion headquarters, and they then end the regiment. And in a day or so, uh, uh, someone came and got him. I don't know, have any idea what happened to him. But there were little things like that that uh, that uh, came up, and uh, I on one day while I was still there, I decided to take a walk, and uh, which wasn't the wisest thing to do. There were a few holdouts uh, sniping at people, uh, German soldiers who didn't want to give up and were hiding up in the Alps. But uh, I went out on a hike and uh, came across a group of youngsters, about fourth grade, I would say, with their teacher. And uh, he was talking with them. And uh, he asked if I would stay and talk with them. Of course, they spoke only German, but he spoke some English. And uh, they asked me all kinds of questions uh, about the United States. They got off onto the Empire State Building, and they were trying to decide whether it was taller than the Austrian mountains. <laughs> it was just a nice little scene, and uh, in a very peaceful atmosphere. And uh, I thought, well, the world needs to be a little more like that. But uh, then we were pulled out. We were pulled out to go into South Central Germany. And uh, we were billeted in a hotel in the town of Nürtingen, Germany. Nürtingen is a town of perhaps 20,000 people. And uh, we, this hotel had a kitchen, and uh, we uh, established our company kitchen in this hotel, and we ate off of white tablecloths for a while. <laughs> but our, our work wasn't ended, and uh, one of the major things that we got involved in our, was uh, to locate all the SS troopers in town. Uh, a lot of the SS troopers had uh, gotten out of their uniforms before they gave up and didn't give up. They uh, got back to their houses, their homes, some way or another, you know. So uh, we would do uh, SS raids. We'd get a company of men and surround four city blocks at uh, just at daybreak. Order all the men out, and uh, the women also. We would separate the men and the women, and the men had to take their shirts off and show the underarm here, which they were tattooed with SS, which meant they were SS troopers. And uh, then we dealt with them sent them away to get uh, indoctrinated in some other uh, line of thinking. And uh, uh, that was one of the things that we did. But our, uh, my squad was assigned to, and we were, we were not prepared for this sort of thing. We were as assigned to try to help those people who were dislocated here in Europe thousands and thousands of people who had been you know in slave labor camps or had been moved all over the country and uh, they were trying to find relatives they were trying to f find a way to get back home and uh, we established ourselves in a bank building across from the hotel and uh, 
Uh, these people would come to us. We would try to help in our very limited capacity. Uh, we did uh, help some of them. We were able to get uh, some passes so they could get on some of the trains that were running. And there were a few trains that did still run after the war. And uh, we could get some passes through the military that these folks could get on the train and go in the direction of their home or city. Uh, one uh, interesting couple came to us. The, one, the, the fellow was about 40. The woman was about 30. And uh, uh, they were both att attorneys. They had been trained as attorneys. And uh, they'd met in a slave labor camp, and they wanted to get married. And uh, we, they asked if we could help them get married. They'd been to some office there in the Nerdingen that refused to give them a certificate to get married, whether it was because they were Jewish or uh, what, I don't know. But uh, one of the interpreters in my squad was, as I told you, was his parents had been killed in a concentration camp. And uh, he, we decided we were going to get get something done about them. We, we would get, allow them to get married. They wanted to do the right thing. So uh, we went to uh, an office and a uh, fellow some German behind a desk, and uh, he said we couldn't issue them a certificate. And uh, my interpreter, a rather for formidable guy, if he really got his dander up, uh, said, yes, there will be a certificate issued. And you get one out, and uh, I'll read it, see if it's in order. Well, we got that done, uh, and they also wanted a religious service, and that's customary in Europe. You have the legal, you meet the city requirements or the state's requirements, then you meet your religious uh, requirements. One of the other interpreters in German in my squad was Jewish also, and he could lead Jewish religious services. He agreed to marry them. <laughs> and, uh, so we decided we wanted to have a party for them. And uh, so I th said, well, I'll go over and see the cook, head cook. Well, I walked in the door there in the hotel. And of course, the cooks are notorious for their ways. And, uh, but uh, he said, get out of my kitchen. That was his first words to me. <laughs> and I said, now, Skinny, I have something to really tell you. I think it'll, you'll be interested. He said, I'm not interested in anything. I have 250 men that I have to cook for. Get out. <laughs> I said, no. Now, here's, here's the story. And we think we need a little cake. We're going to have a little party for them. What could you do for us? He said, do you think this is a delicatessen? <laughs> I said, no, I know it's not, but this is, these are unusual circumstances. He said, everything's unusual. <laughs> so I, uh, I hummed and hawed, and he said, and I suppose you want icing on the cake, too. <laughs> I said, well, that'll be nice. And he said, I suppose you want a little man and woman standing on top of it. <laughs> and I said, no, that would, really wouldn't be necessary. So he says, be here at 11 o'clock tomorrow, and I'll see that you, get a, you have a cake. But I never want to see you again. <laughs> uh, he was a, a character. But... Um, those were the things that were going on. Uh, 
there was an information and education program that was also going on, conducted by, I guess, uh, cooperation between the State Department and the U.S. Army, trying to get uh, soldiers acquainted with what, what was happening in other parts of the world, uh, keeping us also abreast of what was going on in Japan or uh, with the Far Eastern conflict. And uh, uh, I was asked to uh, do the information education program. I don't know why, because uh, uh, there were people with far more education there than I had. Um, but we carried that on for some some weeks. We continued to uh, round up SS troopers at every opportunity. We uh, uh, were issued orders by uh, commanding general of U.S. armies that there would be no frater, uh, fraternization with, with the uh, German Germans, either women or men. And it's very strongly written, but uh, that somehow wears thin after a while. And uh, the there was, you know, relationships that developed between uh, soldiers and German women, and and uh, it uh, it was something that. Regardless of who issued the orders, it was going to be disobeyed in some way, mm -hmm. sometimes rather on a wholesale basis. But uh, uh, during that time, I was offered a chance to go to the uh, or to attend the university, the University of Sorbonne. This was uh, uh, just one of those things that. Uh, the army was doing for some of the GIs, and uh, but at that time I wanted to wanted to go home. If I took it, it meant that I was not going home. I was going to stay there in, in school. So <clears throat> my interest was in, in going home, and I I uh, did so, and uh, got got home on October. Well, I was, got home in about October 1st. I believe my discharge reads October 5th. And uh, discharged in Fort McCoy in Wisconsin. Now, when, when you left Europe, how was it determined when you could go home? They established a point system. A point system that uh, had several parts to it uh, and you had to uh, get so many points in order to, to go home. Mm -hmm. uh, how many theaters you had been in. When a the by a theater, uh, like North Africa was a theater of mm -hmm. war. Uh, the Italian campaign uh, was a theater. The southern France or uh, any part of France mm -hmm. was a French campaign. I never tried to keep track of them, but uh, uh, it's surprising how many the records the Army does keep. But uh, uh, I had five or six campaigns that mm -hmm. I was in. Uh, the number of uh, years you had been overseas counts so much. Mm -hmm. uh, the medals that you may have earned. Mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, two Purple Hearts and those uh, were uh, important. Uh, that is, they carried a lot of points uh, mm -hmm. with them. Uh, did I say Combat Infantry Badge? Mm -mm. Right, combat Infantry Badge. And then uh, Bronze Star. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things. Uh, added up to 
I got to go home pretty early, mm -hmm. uh, earlier than a lot of fellows. Now, do you do you think that um, the Army wanted to keep you, in other words, by sending you to school at the Sorbonne, do you think that they wanted to encourage you to stay in the mm -hmm. military? Because you had, yeah. you know, you had had a lot of responsibility for a very young person. Yeah. And I, I really don't know. Uh, uh, I don't think they may have wanted to encourage a number of people, but uh, uh, I wasn't very interested for one thing, <laughs> and. Uh, but it could well be. I've, I've never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. But thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you were discharged, you were, were you still in Europe in October? I, or I, I left Europe in, uh, uh, let's see, it took about 16, 17, uh, no, 12 days to get across. Uh, it was in September, late September, that uh, landed in the States and then went by train to Fort, Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. So, so you were on a transport ship? Yes. And where did the ship then enter the U.S.? In Boston. In Boston. Mm -hmm. And so then from Boston you went by, by train, train to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Now, along the way or before you left, were there any military ceremonies that recognized people's service? No. Did that happen when you got home? No. No? Did it happen when you were in Wisconsin? No. No. So th there was no formal recognition? That's right. No parades, no welcome home? Absolutely none. Absolutely none. Now, how did people feel about that? Uh, I never heard anyone really express themselves on it. Uh, uh, I think the people were deeply appreciative, but it had been a long war, and I think people were just happy to have their sons and daughters home. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I don't know. I. I I think I would have felt out of place uh, in a parade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, what What was it like being on a transport ship then coming home as opposed to when you went? Oh, it was, uh, the mood was much higher. And uh, we, uh, a lot of singing, a lot of jokes, uh, a lot of telling of stories and uh, what they were on their plans for uh, uh, schooling or for work. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of looking forward. Yeah. That's. Uh, it was pretty lighthearted uh, mood. There were. Uh, uh, frankly, there were some who were dreading it. Uh, some whose wives had decided that they didn't want to wait any longer. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were some really despondent men uh, in regard to that mm -hmm. uh, on, on the boat. But in general, the mood was much lighter. So you, when you came home then, you were at F Fort McCoy mm -hmm. in Wisconsin. Camp McCoy. Camp, I'm sorry, Camp McCoy. Camp McCoy. And how long did you have to remain there before you were able to come home? We were there perhaps a week, no longer. Mm -hmm. And was there any kind of program then that was offered to help people return to civilian life? No, mm -hmm. there was not. It was a quick processing. You were uh, physically examined um, and determined whether or not you were going to get uh, some pension because of uh, mm -hmm. wounds. Uh, 
if you had needed dental work, which I did, I, need, I needed dental work, but I didn't want to stay around and, and get it there. I'd had my two, not, two front teeth knocked out in a shell burst, and uh, I had knocked my head down on my rifle barrel, and I should have had those replace, but I waited till I got home to get a civilian mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to do it. But uh, it was processed, everything, everybody was processed very quickly. Everybody wanted to get home, and I think there were a lot of mistakes made. For example? Uh, people, uh, young men who should have received a pension of some sort, mm -hmm. or a larger pension than than they did, and uh, some men who didn't get anything who should have. You mm -hmm. know, I, uh, some men, uh, there, uh, in all truth, there were some men who were there psychologically. Uh, uh, harmed by the war, mm -hmm. you know, and many of them were just, it was just over, it was looked over, Are you, mm -hmm. uh, something you'll grow out of, mm -hmm. uh, something, it'll be all right, so they passed them on through. Do you think it was a lack of understanding, or was it a callousness on the part of the military? I think it was, I think it was both. Mm -hmm. It was both that. There's a lot of attention now being given to that and mm -hmm. some uh, va veterans who are coming in. And <clears throat> I receive a 10% a disability. But, you know, uh, that when that started out, I got $10 a month. It was a disability pay at the time I was discharged. And uh, I, you know, I've led a life in which I haven't been hindered by the wounds. Mm -hmm. uh, they bother me at times, but I, I have led a, I hope, a productive life. And uh, uh, the, it never bothered me that it was just 10%. Mm -hmm. I, was, I could have probably gotten along without it, all right. Okay. You were wounded twice. How do you gather the courage to go back? I mean, how do you psychologically then, you're in a, in a recuperation hospital, and they tell you, okay, it's time to go back. How do you mentally gear up to do that? Well, I, I could uh, put it this way. It ain't easy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, you, you, uh, you look at it uh, partly this way. That, uh, you're serving with a group of fellows in your squad that you have ever respect for. And uh, you think, you know, I need, we need to get back together. Uh, we, uh, it's important that we get the war over uh, important that we do our, keep doing our, our uh, share. And uh, you, you get back to the unit and you are happy to see some of the fellows and, and you find out that some are gone mm -hmm. in your absence that, and won't be back. But uh, I went, 
I went back, and uh, I must I must tell you, you know, that I have the same fears and that anybody else has. And uh, I, there were many nights you were shaking in your boots, but. You're kind of buttressed by uh, the people around you. I found that GIs were, for the most part, people who look looked on the brighter side. Uh, I, if you had a patrol that was going out, and the first sergeant says, "No." Uh, I think that this is going to be a bad patrol. I look for a couple of you not going to return, but we needed to do it. And most of the GIs look around and and say, "Well, I wonder who's going to get it, and well, I bet it'll be so and so." They never think of it as being them, and uh, I try then they try not to. But I, I never gave uh, a lot of uh, thought to preparing myself mentally to to go back. It was just something that you did. Mm -hmm. I, it, it was it was going to happen, you know, and mm -hmm. you just I was always ready to, ready to. Uh, go back, uh, but uh, I was very happy when the war was over. <laughs> and recall a young man uh, had spoken of him earlier as sort of a uh, very handsome devil, and he had uh, done some very courageous things as a member of a rifle squad before he joined my squad. And uh, he, uh, toward the end of the war, uh, he, he came in much after, after me. He was, I was with the 36, six months before he joined us. But uh, he didn't, uh, he he just couldn't hold himself together uh, and, until the war was over, and uh, I was in a foxhole with him, and he was reading the Bible and shaking like a leaf, and uh, he got hit there in that hole, and uh, so I helped uh, helped him get back. It wasn't a bad one, but. Uh, he was just no good after that. Mm -hmm. uh, he came back to join us, but he was never the same. Never the same. I'm not sure I was, but... <laughs> what makes a good soldier? Well, a lot of people have tried to answer that, answer that question. I read an interesting article once written by a, uh, a rather high officer who had been through a lot of soldiering. And uh, he said, the best soldiers that I have in, I encountered and I think uh, that others have encountered are men from the South. The Southerners have had more of a tradition of soldiering than people in the north part of the country. And uh, he said it just kind of runs and seems to run in their blood. But he went on to say that uh, he would, if, he, if we're just talking pure infantry, just the riflemen. He said, I want, I want fellows 
who are just willing to take orders and carry them out. Uh, they accept what you say and they go do it. Mm -hmm. I don't want guys who are sitting around trying to analyze every move that is going to take place. I want fellows who will get up and act. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was his view of it. Uh, the fellows that I had in my, my unit were very good uh, soldiers. Their duties were a little bit different and uh, they did a lot of <laughs> a lot of uh, beefing about what they were going to have to do but they always, in the end, uh, did it. After the war, they were uh, the world's worst soldiers. <laughs> but, uh, but when it came down to the, the war itself, they were good. I don't know how to answer, the, answer that question. Uh, I look around uh, today and I see a lot of young men who, if we suddenly need uh, many more soldiers than we now have, and that's always a possibility, are going to have one heck of a hard time getting in shape physically. And I think with, the, with physically, uh, they're so terribly over, overweight, it also affects their emotions. I can't help it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, I find that it's really disturbing to me to, to see that. Uh, I'm, no, I'm a lightweight myself, but at that time I was in fairly good shape. I don't know uh, other than that how to answer you other than when I was in the, uh, doing basic training there were an awful lot of southern boys in the group and uh, frankly I, I just had to ad ad admire them they were a pretty good group of soldiers and uh, I I think this general who wrote this article had something when he said that there is a tradition in the South regarding soldiering. Hmm. And uh, I wish I could be more analytical and answer hmm. that question, but I, I really can't. When you left uh, Camp McCoy, did you go home to? Yes, I went straight home. Okay. Uh, to Alton, Illinois, where my father was still working in the glass works. Uh, my mother was a, a supervisor of women employees in a large mental institution. And what happened when you got home? Was it? Was it easy to adjust to life outside of the military, or were there issues? I think I, I think I had a, a little problem adjusting. Uh, I was kind of footloose uh, and uh, wasn't r really sure. How to, and I, I knew that I wanted to become a teacher. But I didn't know just how I was going to go about that. And uh, I fretted and worried about it quite a bit. Uh, where would I go to school? Would it be better to stay home and go? Or, and uh, was I really, uh, I kept asking myself, Am I really cut out to be a teacher? And uh, do I have those intellectual qualities that I think 
fit that profession. I struggled with that for a while. And finally decided whether or not well, I was going to go ahead and do it. And uh, I, I think my folks, my parents worried about it a bit. And, uh, but they were pretty gentle people and uh, uh, you know, let me figure it out pretty much. And I de determined that I would go to a, a college right in Alton, a denominational college, uh, and start the training there. What, what was that school? It was uh, Shirtliff College, a school that no longer exists. Mm -hmm. It was a ba Baptist operation. It's been, uh, uh, the campus is now part of Southern Illinois University mm -hmm. Dental School. And uh, it's there today. And uh, not about s oh, 69 years ago, we were, my wife and I were, married and this campus had a great deal to do with that marriage and uh, I went on to go to Washington University in St. Louis before a master's degree in educational administration and a uh, uh, master's degree in history. Mm -hmm. Now when you were studying history was war or World War II was that of interest to you in your studies? Yes, it was. Uh, the insights, uh, studying other wars uh, and uh, other parts of the world. Uh, I had some outstanding professors at uh, Washington University and they would relate it to the uh, current situation. Uh, I. Uh, I found that uh, my own war experiences helped me understand uh, some of the things that had gone on in the world, mm -hmm. and uh, I would go ahead with the questions. Huh? Um, when you were in Europe, did you keep any diaries or journals? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not a... Uh, were you constantly in combat when you were in Europe for the most part? The majority, of, the majority of the time you were there in, until March. Uh -huh. uh, were you continually on the front line and in combat? Uh, Any time I was uh, out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, on the front line, with this exception. I got to go to a rest camp at uh, Caserta, Italy. I got, the, got there for three days. It was the King's Palace of Italy in uh, Caserta, which is north of Naples. And uh, we didn't get to sleep in the palace, but we got to sleep in the King's stables. <laughs> And there was a difference. <laughs> but I was there, and then I had uh, a few days in Nice, France. Now, were, were you kind of typical of the U.S. soldier of in that in Europe, being so much in the front line on the front line? Most uh, the ratio of men is something like this. For every soldier on the front line, there are about 11 people behind the line. That's what uh, we are great on keeping records. We have to keep supplies moving. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, that for every man, that's on the front. There have to be about 11 to 13 men supporting him. Mm 
Now, is this supporting him in Europe or supporting him across the board back in the United States? That's uh, uh, just totally, mm -hmm. totally. Mm -hmm. Now, do you feel that you were well supplied as a soldier? Yes. I, uh, when you look at other armies, you have to recognize that uh, we did a better job. And uh, sometimes you were issued things that didn't seem to work. Or, for example, everyone was issued gas masks. First thing you threw away was your gas mask. It just was uh, a useless piece of equipment, we felt. And uh, the gas really wasn't a part of things in World War II. Mm -hmm. It had been in World War I. But uh, uh, that was an item that went by the wayside. Uh, there were little weapons sometimes. Uh, the carbine, which is a small rifle, was not nearly as effective as it, sh as it uh, had, they had hoped it would be. And uh, the Germans had better uh, comparable rifles. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were there were instances that when well some of the clothing items uh, uh, didn't didn't work well, but for the most part we had the things that really counted. Was the carbine your weapon? No, I preferred the uh, M1. Mm -hmm. And was, was that the, something you had from the beginning to the end? The, yes, the same M1. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to keep it in good operating condition. And we had a first sergeant who would, he'd look at our weapon up on the front line, you know, he'd come around and want to look at it, see that it was in good working mm -hmm. order. And, uh, but it was, it was a fine, fine weapon. But in these days, in warfare, in the Middle East today, that's not the rifle of choice. Mm -hmm. they, uh, we have other equipment that shoots bullets much faster, <laughs> one way of putting it. What are some of the items of clothing that weren't successful? Um, the raincoat, uh, I felt, was never very successful. It, uh, seemed to, to uh, crack and uh, uh, there was a sort of an inner lining to it and uh, the exterior was covered with some sort of plastic or plastic material and uh, tended to crack open and leak uh, so you weren't always dry. Um, for a long time, we were issued uh, leggings, which was a laced up thing here that you, uh, when I first went in the army, that's what I had. And uh, the legging uh, was out, out of canvas, and uh, you had a long lace that intertwined up here and you pulled it tight, mm -hmm. and uh, then that fit down over the top of your shoes. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, that's clumsy. And uh, so Army soon abandoned that and gave us a combat boot, which uh, came up to here, had two straps on it with a buckle mm -hmm. each. When yeah. did you receive that item of clothing? Uh, that uh, began to, uh, our troops began to get issued in a, uh, just below casino, mm -hmm. just below casino. And were people happy with those boots? For the most part. Mm -hmm. They weren't uh, uh, waterproof by any means. There's a very famous cartoon written by Bill Malden, the G.I.'s cartoonist. And he has a general in a jeep going down a muddy road and they're alongside here or uh, soldiers 
walking in mud that's this steep. And the army has a material they call debon, which is like a grease that you're supposed to put on your shoe and it'll turn the water. Well, doesn't really do it. But the general looks over to the soldier and he says, have you tried debon, soldier? <laughs> because <laughs> uh, Malden could rub it in. So great. Now, were you, did you see Malden while you were? Never saw Malden. So it was after the war was over, you saw Malden? Uh, yes. He, he became a cartoonist for St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fellow, uh, Malden left and went home. And the fellow chosen to take his place as a cartoonist was a class, uh, high school buddy of mine named Red Schmidt, and he was a fine artist. Well, uh, Sch Schmidt uh, got a chance to come home, and we started college together in Alton. Mm. And uh, we took an anatomy class together, and Schmidt, uh, we had to draw muscles and bones, and the professor was always accusing Schmidt of copying the muscles, these drawings. He could, he could draw better than the uh, people who had uh, written the textbooks. Mm. But it was just interesting that Malden and uh, Schmidt's paths crossed. Um, how did you keep in touch with your family back home? Did you write letters? Did they write letters to you? Yes, I wrote letters. And uh, I tried to write as often as I could. And, you know, long periods of time, you're in a hole or in a house where you've got some, uh, it may be on the front, but there's nothing going on much mm -hmm. right now. And so you write, uh, you write a letter. And uh, they try to get the mail to you as well, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought they did a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Occasionally, uh, your mail was censored by a, an officer. That's part of the game. Mm -hmm. And sometimes my folks would get a letter with something was crossed out. So would they look at your, would your mail be in an envelope and sealed and they would open it up or would you have to give it to an officer to read before well, it was sent home? You had a... Uh, You'd, you'd send yours, depending on where you were, you'd send them to your company mail clerk. Every company had a mail clerk. And uh, you'd send them to him. He would in turn turn them over to an officer who was back off the front someplace. And he uh, would snip them open with a pair of scissors and, and uh, take them out and read them mm -hmm. and uh, decide whether he could let the whole thing go, or some of it had to be cut out. Mm -hmm. I never had much trouble with it because I knew pretty well that what you could do and and uh, couldn't do. First time I was wounded, I uh, had a nerve injury in the armpit, and I, I lost the use of my hand. I couldn't write. There was a soldier in the bed next to mine, a fellow by the name of Scaramucci. I'll never forget him. He uh, wrote my letters for me. Now, did your parents keep your letters? So did yes, they kept. Mm -hmm. uh, they kept a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Did you reread them after you came home? Uh, I read a couple, mm -hmm. but that was that mm -hmm. was all. When you came home, did you? want to talk about your experiences or did people want to talk with you about your experiences? Uh, some people wanted to talk about them. Uh, most people respected your your privacy. Uh, most of uh, the friends that uh, my folks had knew that, that I had uh, seen quite a lot of combat and uh, 
they welcomed me home. And, uh, but that was about as far as it, it went. They, they didn't probe very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, in respect to talking about it, my best friend, uh, uh, all during college, in fact, from high school, was a, a young man who had been in the service and received a terrible black back wound. And uh, we were together down there every day. But I don't remember once we ever talking about the war. Mm -hmm. Not once. It just left us. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he was became a pharmacist and I became a teacher. Uh. Was there any point in your life then when you talked about the war? Uh, I, I, I told my wife some of the things mm -hmm. that went on, and uh, occasionally I would see, uh, uh, occasionally made a, a friend or two with whom I felt very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I knew whatever I said to them wouldn't be passed on, mm -hmm. and it wasn't. And I, I did talk to a few people like that. And uh, there were a couple people, you know, those little articles that I wrote. And you mm -hmm. have to, mm -hmm. there were a couple people. Uh, I think just two that I shared those with. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, my boys never probed too much. Uh, I would talk about the funny things that happened, mm -hmm. you know, and there were a lot of funny things that happened. Like we were on a front line and the Germans were 60 feet down in a street. There was a keg of wine. I got uh, uh, the fellows in my squad emptied that keg into a dishpan. And there was a goat walking around. This was a live goat. And uh, they had the goat drink the wine. And then this was a house that evidently had w women living in it mm -hmm. at some point. And the fellows went in and got some lipstick, and they got a hat, and they got a scarf, <laughs> and a skirt, and they dressed this goat up. The goat was really wobbly, but the same. <laughs> <laughs> we put the goat out in the street and pushed him in the direction of the German troops. <laughs> we never saw him again. <laughs> I bet they ate him. <laughs> but, you know, you share some things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of funny, funny things happen that take you take too many hours to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, have any relatives of yours or friends or uh, come to you to talk with you for advice about going to war? Because we've been in several wars since World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, There have been a couple who have uh, talked with me about uh, their sons and daughters going off. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and daughters are going off to war in this particular time. And what uh, to tell them about war and uh, what to... Uh, what things they should look for, what they should uh, uh, know about their weaponry, learn as much about the other man's weaponry as you can, uh, keep yourself in good physical condition at all times. Mm -hmm. So if you have to run 50 yards, you, can't, you, you can do it with a full pack. Just simple 
stay alive things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then, as far as the uh, psychological side of it, uh, make sure that you um, make make sure that you have some basic idea of what you are fighting for. You have have some information about this. Don't go in uh, uh, there unprepared that you don't know what uh, what the stakes are. And if you uh, if you can't understand a little bit what you're fighting for, you're not going to do well. Mm -hmm. But try very hard to keep abreast of the news, to uh, when you have orientation, and these troops do have uh, orientation, that you take note. Mm -hmm. And that sergeant who's up there just isn't up there because he's beautiful. He knows something that mm -hmm. you need to know. And keep it up here. And the rest of it you keep in your heart. Um, I wanted to ask, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. The, I had several questions. One was, when you were in high school, uh, how, did, how did you learn about the war that was coming? And was your high school education abbreviated so that you could sign up a little earlier to join the military? And I also wanted to, to ask you about how did you learn what the stakes were, and was that something that you took in from learning about the news, or was it also mm -hmm. something that was brought up during your training? Um, <clears throat> I'd always read a great deal. I, I had some fine teachers in high school, but I, uh, uh, I think I read far more than they did. Mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that uh, um, uh, I, I'm saying that because I think it, they just didn't have the time to read that I read, mm -hmm. that I had. And I read primarily uh, current events, uh, economic uh, uh, matters. I read a great deal about labor unions and what was going on with them. I read uh, everything I could get my hands on of what was going on in Nazi Germany, according to the uh, analysts and uh, I I read portions of Mein Kampf the Hitler uh, Bible so to speak uh, parts of it that were uh, translated and I've uh, read that and uh, my teachers uh, seem to recognize that I uh, had read fairly widely. I never did very well on the uh, subjects that they were teaching. Uh, I was free. <laughs> I passed them, of course, but I, uh, I, I just tried to keep a, uh, it kind of consumed me. I really wanted to know. I, and uh, I read greatly about uh, the great rivalry, or the great uh, uh, war that went on in uh, Spain prior to World War II. And uh, the struggle that, that was there, it was a testing ground for the communists on one hand and the Nazis on the other hand. And uh, you, I studied that, read it, followed it, uh, read a great deal about uh, Benito Mussolini, uh, what uh, his troops had done in, Italy, in uh, Ethiopia, Africa. 
that was uh, part of my growing up. I just, mm -hmm. I, I guess it uh, helped me form my ideas of what uh, this world is about and uh, some of the injustices that are, are going on. Uh, the rest of your question here, I maybe I lost it. Um, I think I've lost the thread of my question too. When you then were in basic training, what did the, did the military teach you things about the enemy that the enemy? And I don't know if they knew you were going to Europe or the Pacific. And did any of that run counter to what? you had come across in your reading? Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, they didn't do a great deal in regard to helping us understand uh, all the political and economic uh, uh, developments that were taking place. Uh, they just tried to make you understand that here here was an enemy and uh, you had to do your best to defeat it. Uh, they weren't real, the army wasn't real strong at that time on orientation and uh, on uh, education. I think they are doing a better job now, are trying to uh, there's a little bit of a strain, I understand, going on because we're using up troops so rapidly right at the moment. But uh, this army that we have has been a, uh, recently has been a well-trained uh, army with more political in, uh, uh, information than any army before it. And I think that uh, uh, we were not nearly so well mm -hmm. informed that way. Now, when you were in basic, did you know you were going to Europe versus the Pacific? No, no. I did not. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all wondered, and uh, at the end of those uh, 16 weeks, they were sent us home. That, uh, and they told us to, however, to where to report. And uh, mine was Newport News, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, by that I knew pretty well mm -hmm. where it would be, of course. But no, we, we, we didn't discuss it. Mm -hmm. Now, when you did get to Europe, did your opinions change at all about Germans when you were there and when you came home and became even more studious of history? Did your opinions change at all again? Well, yes, uh, yes and uh, no. Uh, I, I'm a person who finds it difficult to carry to carry grudges, to carry uh, hatred, uh, and uh, I have since had several friends who are German. Mm -hmm. I sat down and uh, a fellow who, a German soldier who had fought against me at casino cooked my breakfast. I didn't know whether I was going to be poisoned or mm -hmm. not, but he cooked my breakfast. Uh, but I, uh, now, but there are certain things that I just cannot forget. And that's a, uh, <clears throat> the treatment of about six million Jewish people. Not only the Jewish people, but there were other racial groups, 
gypsies, for example, mm -hmm. in Europe, who were also murdered by the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And it has bothered me ever since that here was Germany with some of the finest schools in the world at before World War II, some of the very best schools. And here they were indoctrinating people to do that kind of thing. And uh, there are people, you know, they had to have the cooperation of people to do it. Mm -hmm. And it, it is just eaten me up ever since. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I individually have found some fine German friends. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that you have traveled to Europe, I, I think, I was told 18 times since the war. Uh, 12 times. 12 times since mm -hmm. the war ended. And have you visited any of the places where you engaged in battle? Yes. Uh, I've been to Casino. Uh, uh, and I've been to Celestat. Uh, Celestat. Uh, I've been to... Uh, Kaiserslautern, uh, been t to uh, uh, Rebovale uh, several times, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been, uh, I think I spoke about uh, uh, infiltrating the German lines for about 12 miles and uh, in order to overlook the city of Celestat, and that, that I had found a, a hotel tavern at the top of this mountain. And, and uh, I went back in search of that hotel. Mm -hmm. I was about to give up, and I turned a corner, and there it was. Oh, my goodness. And uh, uh, so it's quite a thrill. Okay. But uh, yes, I've been, been back that, those times. I'd like to go back again. But the time moves on. What is that experience like to go back? Beg your pardon? What is that experience like to go back? Oh, it's, uh, it brings back so many, so many uh, memories. And I uh, think again how difficult it was to cross certain valleys and certain streams and uh, but then I see some of these cities like Casino, they, they, they have rebuilt and you have to admire the human spirit that says, you know, life has to go on. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my, I guess I get more emotional, extremely emotional uh, at Casino when I visit the... Uh, graves of New Zealanders and uh, Polish uh, folks who lost about a thousand people. Uh, I, uh, I can't help but uh, be emotional. And uh, then I have stopped at the graves, uh, cemeteries of World War I soldiers. And uh, a very moving experience. And uh, I recall, I was just about, we were just about to pull out of the cemetery and there was a sports car pulled up with a license plate that indicated England. And uh, a man about 35 or 40 got out. And he <clears throat> went over to the uh, cemetery, and stood looking at it, and there's a book there which people could sign giving their feelings regarding this. And I noticed he signed it. But, uh, you know, this, this was a war that was long over before his time. But I could see that he was uh, in tears. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you might like to talk about at this point? Uh, I think uh, I think I've held forth about enough, and uh, there are things I could go on and talk about. But would you like to talk about the impact this experience has had on your life? Yeah. Well, yes. It uh, it has been a, it was a tremendous influence in my life. I can't help but. Uh, think that uh, my view of uh, history and uh, historical matters uh, have been shaped by this war. Uh, my regard for human life, I think, has uh, been directly influenced I have my, my feeling for people I think has been influenced greatly by the war we've tried to express that my wife and I in various ways among them with an exchange program with students and not only those three students that we've had for a year at a time, but we've had an awful lot of uh, students come in for lesser periods. Uh, uh, Japanese, uh, Chinese, African, uh, all over the world. And uh, we've, uh, we used to have in the community I was in, uh, big international weekends. And uh, we had about 30 or 40 people, most of them from U of I. And uh, they would come in, spend the night or two nights, would have a symposium and uh, discuss problems. It was kind of a, in that community, it was kind of an exciting time. And, uh, but I think, uh, the war has helped me uh, shape uh, my political views, my social outlook. I hope for the better. <laughs> I've had I've had a lot of fun teaching, and uh, a lot of good kids. Uh, I think I told you about the boy who uh, asked the question. We, we were studying, this is early in my teaching career, and it was about four years after the war. And uh, this boy was not bright, but he was a bright star in that classroom. He was just had a wonderful personality. and uh, But he was probably the poorest student in the and the bunch, and this was before we, but uh, you know, we had special programs for kids who were slow. Uh, we uh, were studying history at the last period of the day. Not a good time to study history, but at that time, if you knew me, I had a five o'clock shadow by three thirty <laughs> in the afternoon, and uh, uh, we were reading the history book, and it said the soldiers have hard times during the, war, during the war, something like that. Some student raised the question, what do they mean by hard times? Well, I don't like to be graphic with them, so I just told them that uh, there was a time when uh, it went about six weeks without having enough water to wash my face. And I said, when I got back, I just had a terrible time scrubbing that soot and the dirt uh, off of my face. And uh, I could see Bruce, he was in the back of the room and he was really puzzled. And he raised his hand and he says, 
Uh, I, I ignored him first, and then he raised his hand again. He says, Mr. Willard. And uh, I ignored him this time again. And uh, then he finally says, Mr. Willard. And he stood up, and I said, Bruce, what is it? He said, it's still a little bit dark right around here. <laughs> and uh, the class roared. He was a very popular kid, very handsome, well-built. He just didn't have the enough up here to mm -hmm. help him along. And uh, I've, had, well, I've had a lot of good kids, a lot of very successful kids. I think that's about all I have to say. Mr. Waller, thank you. It's been a pleasure. This gentleman over here has had to bore all, bear all this. And thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to... It's had some ups and downs emotionally for me. I can imagine. I hope they don't show too much. I moved here. Called uh, History... History in a trunk, and uh, we have about ten trunks. And uh, this is after I left the school business, but I was working with historical society, and uh, we developed ten trunks. Each trunk, a certain topic. One of them was World War II. One of them, and uh, in there were artifacts of all different kinds, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some that showed the contrast of what uh, we first had in, in, a, in a certain period of history and what we have now, like a, uh, a coal oil lamp. And over here is a bright electric bulb, mm -hmm. and uh, all the things that go between the development of those. And you use the, those kinds of things, and third, fourth, fifth grade in your teaching. Uh, one of them is, uh, and this one takes a little while for the kids to soak in just what it is. The teacher puts out, let's see, how is it? Oh, oh a, uh, a roll of toilet paper. And one end of the trunk, and the other end, a leaf, and the kids wonder about it. And finally, it dawns on them what what is there, and uh, it's just it's it's an interesting project, and it's going along very well. Is it going to be continuous? Yes, it's mm -hmm. it's in its second year now, and uh, we take it. We have a group of volunteers. Now I say we because I'm no longer there, but uh, 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 some retired teachers who are quite capable. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are working up these trunks. They go in and talk to the class. They leave the trunk there for a week, and the trunk is picked up and taken to another school. They keep rotating around. Oh. And uh, it's one of the things that I was able to get started, and uh, although I had done something like this when I, uh, I headed a fine arts program, fine arts, uh, improvement of fine arts teaching. It was a three-year program, and I worked at that for three years, and uh, then, uh, <coughs> Ten regional or ten county superintendents asked that I head a project to uh, determine the way that county school offices should be managed in the future. The legislation had been passed that the 102 county superintendents could no longer there could no longer be that arrangement. We had to reduce the number of counties, county superintendents, by around half. And that meant the merger 
of county school offices. And how was it to be done? How was it to be financed? How, what services could it offer for school districts?